this session will provide information on how to make appropriate empiric antibiotic selections in the A&E setting, covering the causative pathogens, agents that provide coverage, and risk factors for resistance. The thought process for choosing the correct antibiotic contains five key steps and many other considerations. The first is knowing what type of infection you are treating, its location, and confirming the diagnosis by looking at vital signs, labs, imaging studies, patient history, physical examination, and other diagnostic information. Once you know what type of infection you are treating, you need to determine if the patient has any risk factors for resistance with the three risk factors with the most supporting evidence being where did the patient acquire the infection such as in the community or in a hospital or old age home. Second, has the patient had any other recent infections or received antibiotics recently? After knowing this information, then you need to determine what are the likely microorganisms causing the infection. Then, what antibiotics cover the pathogens you suspect would be the most likely culprits for the infection. This information can be obtained from many sources, including international guidelines like the IDSA, local guidelines like the impact guidelines, tertiary literature sources like the Sanford Guide or Up to Date. However, the most accurate source for your situation would be found by reviewing the local hospital antibiogram. Lastly, you should determine of all the antibiotic options with the lowest resistance rates that will cover all the likely pathogens, which one has the most narrow spectrum so as to reduce the incidence of adverse effects like C. diff and minimize exposure of our more broad spectrum antibiotics to reduce resistance rates and reserve them for more critical and desperate cases. In addition to these primary concerns to address coverage of the infection, there are some other host factors and considerations that may influence your antibiotic selection. Some of the more obvious factors would be allergies, renal or hepatic function, age, pregnancy, and other interacting medications or disease states. A question that clinical pharmacists often get are questions about antibiotic penetration into the site of the infection, such as into the bone or central nervous system. Antibiotics with relatively good bone penetration include the fluoroquinolones, cefepime, metronidazole, linezolid, daptomycin, and clindamycin. Antibiotics with good CNS penetration include the fluoroquinolones again, metronidazole, uh, cotrimoxazole, and linezolid due to their smaller molecular size and lipophilic characteristics. Severity of the patient's condition can also influence selection because going too narrow with the choice of antibiotic results in more detrimental outcomes so there is less room for error therefore we will generally choose agents with a bit more broad spectrum activity. Initial inadequate therapy can occur due to several causes, including not covering the infecting pathogen or if the pathogen is resistant to the selected agent, also if the wrong dose was used or if combination therapy was not used when it should have been. Inadequate initial therapy has strong data showing it leads to a dramatic increase in mortality particularly in high-risk patients. Since in the accident and emergency department we do not have any gram stain or culture results, it is an odds game where you have to take your best evidence-based guess 
on what the likely pathogens are based on the site, type, and location of acquisition of the infection. Four examples are listed here of the most common pathogens, although these can very well be different in patients with nosocomial infections. Intraabdominal can be particularly tricky in predicting the causative pathogen because other than in peritonitis, it is often a polymicrobial infection consisting of anaerobes like Bacteroides and Clostridium as well as aerobes. The proper intraabdominal culture on average grows about three different bacterial species. Next, after we have an idea of what the pathogens we want to cover for are, we have several options for resources to help make our coverage selection. Some people use the impact guidelines, however, these guidelines are not updated annually and are looking at data that are from other distant hospitals. So local guidelines are not as dependable as your hospital's antibiogram that should be updated annually and includes patients more from your vicinity. Here are two examples of how impact guideline selection would not be good to follow. The impact guidelines recommend augmentin and levofloxacin as options for a UTI. However, sensitivity rates from the Prince of Wales Hospital antibiogram show sensitivity rates of 65 and 68 percent for these agents for the most common pathogen by far, which is E. coli. Therefore, following the impact guidelines would not be correct in this scenario. Also, looking at sensitivity rates for ampicillin or amoxicillin for one of the most common pathogens in cellulitis, the sensitivity rate is below the recommended threshold of 80% at only 65%. Therefore, following the impact guidelines for a UTI or a cellulitis case, would be expected to lead to therapy failure in about one in every three patients in this scenario at Prince Wales Hospital. The key point here is to make sure you utilize your hospital's antibiogram and have it readily available for reference when practicing in the A&E. Being generally familiar with what drug classes cover which types of bacteria is highly useful in the A&E. Otherwise, you would be constantly referring to literature sources. Antibiotics are so hugely common with 30 to 50 percent of patients in the hospitals in Australia being on antibiotics and 20 to 40 percent of hospitalized patients in the USA being on an antibiotic, you can see how burdensome it would be if you are not knowledgeable with spectrum of coverage as an A&E pharmacist. The last area I want to discuss is what are the risk factors for resistance? When would I want to consider a more broad spectrum empiric selection for patients upon presenting to the A&E? Unfortunately, many of these risk factors are infection site specific. The risk factors for having a resistant intraabdominal infection are listed here, including some specific ones regarding peritonitis, having cancer, elderly age, or being malnourished. This table is adapted from the IDSA guidelines for hospital or ventilator acquired pneumonia somewhat different than the risk factors for resistance and mortality in the intra-abdominal infection slide. However, some of the risk factors are considered more universal regardless of infection site, including the main three of recent hospitalization, old age home residence, or recent antibiotics. Immunosuppression and recent travel history are also red flags that warrant serious consideration for selection of more broad spectrum agents.
Here are some additional risk factors for other types of infections like UTI and cellulitis that should help you make more accurate predictions of which patients need more broad therapy. This concludes this brief intro into making empiric antibiotic selections in the A&E. Thank you for your time and attention.